This demonstration is called Psychiatry Medicine Dark Side. We're testing about uh, psychiatry. Their conference this year is called Psychiatry Medicine's Heartland. And so uh, I thought that it's more, more likely to be Psychiatry Medicine's Dark Side. And so that's why we've got Darth Vader here. And we're saying welcome to the dark side to anybody that wants to go in. Psychiatry Medicine's Heartland here. Uh, I think they're, they're wishful thinking there. I don't think they would be, most of medicine would regard uh, kind of psychiatry as being its heartland. Nevertheless, we've called it something different. We've called it Psychiatry Medicine's Dark Side here. Yeah? Uh, because, because so much is hidden. Uh, and, you know, there are all these things, they like to present themselves as nice people, but a lot of them are not nice people. Even if they are nice people, what they're doing yes. might not amount to being very nice. What we think of when we, when we think of the big bedlam is the 18th and 19th century bedlam, when it did become a much larger and more modern kind of asylum. Inmates are confined to sometimes to cells, other times to sort of wooden cubicles and shared dormitories. But there would also have been restraint points on the walls, that's a rather crucial point, so that if anybody did get out of hand they could, they could be restrained. So you would actually have had people, people here with mental illness, mm being actually physically fastened to walls so they couldn't, they couldn't move. Yes, absolutely. Restraint is a, is a crucial part of the culture of early Bedlam. So it appears that Bedlam soon abandoned the good intentions of its founders and became more like a prison than a hospital. cases when a person is simply saying I don't want the injection I'd rather take my medication in a tablet form uh, they, from what I've seen they won't hesitate to then use physical force on that person I mean I've seen people crying and shaking in absolute distress following being held down and restrained and you know th this is a psychiatric hospital a lot of the patients here have a lot of fears they feel they're being persecuted they have a lot of you know sometimes strange ideas about you know being kidnapped or sort of hunted and things like this. So can you imagine how it's going to be for a person like that to be forcefully taken by six people, held down and injected? But from what I've seen, the professionals don't seem to appreciate the impact of what they're doing. As a patient in a psychiatric ward, you're in a very, very difficult situation. You, you know, you've, you've lost your freedom, you're taken away from your friends and family, you're forced to take medication you don't want to take. And the more angry you get, the more chance of that being seen as part of your illness. So I see people come into the hospital um, they get worse from, from what I've seen. I've seen people get worse because they get so upset about being being imprisoned in hospital and they start acting up and then that's seen as their illness. Um, also you the, use the word imprisoned in hospital. Yeah. Do you see like this hospital as similar to people being well, in prison? A, a lot of my clients have told me that it's worse than prison because I've worked with people who've been in the prison system as well they said at least in prison they don't force you to take medication and you know when you're going to get released. 
I've heard that two or three times, people saying they actually prefer prison to the, to the hospital. First an inpatient, they wouldn't let me out at all. For the first two weeks I was stuck in, indoors. I wasn't even allowed down to the garden. Then what happens is that the, the um, psychiatrist grants you half an hour escorted leave, maybe twice a day. Escorted means you have to be accompanied by a nurse. So you're then faced with the problem of trying to persuade a nurse to take you down to the garden. And they won't take you. They're too busy. They're short-staffed. Any excuse not to take you. This is a human right. Fresh air and exercise is a human right. And it is enshrined in the UN Convention on uh, Persons with Disabilities, on the rights of persons with disabilities, which actually says you have the right to refuse treatment. That means everyone. And, and I've, I've been told, one of the um, senior social workers on my team said, oh, that's for people with physical disabilities. No, it isn't. Because uh, the people, some of the people that worked on that with the UN were psychiatric survivors. And, and the rights are not to, to, to be able to refuse treatment and also not to be imprisoned because you have a disability, or you are considered to have a disability. So basically, the Mental Health Act violates those rights, the British Mental Health Act. Beatings also formed a key part of Bedlam's treatment programme. Little wonder it became the most notorious madhouse in history. It seems totally barbaric to us that you can cure somebody by chaining them up, beating them, and having them lying, vomiting, and their own, own filth. To us, it seems like a sadistic form of punishment. Until about the mid-20th century, no one thought there was much that could really be done for mental health problems. Um, but that all changed from the 1940s with the introduction of these heroic procedures into psychiatry, which some of, some of you may have heard of, you all will have heard of, because one of them, of course, was ECT. Um, Another one which came in in the 1940s was insulin coma therapy. And of course there was lobotomy and, and other techniques. And some of these procedures, particularly insulin coma therapy and ECT, came to be thought of as acting in a specific way on the underlying disease, in a way that no previous widely accepted treatment had done before. Of course, most of these procedures, particularly insulin coma therapy, were since found to be completely useless, as well as being very dangerous. It had a death rate of about 10%. Um, what about the ECT? When you talk about ECT, electroshock therapy, people say, oh no, we don't do that anymore. And there's a, you know, there's a common conception, we do not give ECT anymore in this country. But we do. And I've met quite a few people who've been given ECT treatment and I've even met someone who was given it without their consent. The person was refusing to have the treatment but they were still taken off to the ECT room, uh, knocked out unconscious and had electricity run through the brain. And the reason they did it, even though the person was saying no, is because there's a loophole in the law where basically if they argue the person doesn't have the capacity to understand that the treatment is helpful or it's a medical treatment, um, then they can give it to the person on that basis. So the example of this person was someone who believed that she was in prison. She didn't think she was in hospital. She thought she'd been taken off to prison, um, which in, in some ways she had. She had been detained in hospital, so it wasn't a million miles from the truth. But because she didn't believe she was in hospital, they could argue that, well, she doesn't understand what the ECT is, so we can still give it to her. And all that happens is the doctor comes and signs a piece of paper, and then they can do it. So don't think that we don't electrocute people anymore because it, it still goes on and just going back to the example of the person I was talking about when I talked to her alone and we had a cup of tea together she didn't believe she was in prison we had normal conversations about her past and her life and the doctors had decided she was too ill for any other treatment other than ECT so when she goes in the room to see the doctors she becomes terrified she starts believing she's in prison um, 
and then they justify giving her the ECT. If someone had spent some time sitting and talking to her, they might not have needed to, you know, induce a seizure or electricity through her brain. So ECT does still go on, and it is still given to people who don't want to have it. Electroshock therapy, my friend, a device that combines the best features of the sleeping pill, the electric chair, and the torture rack. Yeah. You kidding me? Hell no. They strap you to a table. You're touched on each side of the head with wires. Zap! Punishment and therapy in one shocking package. In the asylums of the 20th century, a new breed of treatments meant to cure the most seriously ill. Some, like lobotomies and drug-induced comas, fell out of favour as the old asylums closed down. One, though, is still quietly being used in hospitals up and down the country. ECT started out as an experiment. Doctors noticed some heavily distressed patients would suddenly improve after an epileptic fit. Passing an electric current through the brain could trigger a similar seizure and they hoped a similar response. 75 years later, it's still one of the most controversial, most divisive treatments in mental health. The next step then is to set up monitoring to make sure that he's safe during the treatment. And then at that point I was in a position to put the electrodes on each side of his head and initiate the seizure by passing the electric current. Go. Cool. And you saw there uh, that initially John grimaced because, not because he was in pain, but because we were stimulating the muscles around his face directly with the electricity. EEG is recording nicely. And then after that, you, 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 we could see from the EEG that a seizure had been induced. Um, tonight, okay. We had a holiday in Egypt. It was February 97. And so it would have been just um, a few months before that ECT and it has wiped all memories of this holiday. Helen Crane was given two rounds of ECT in the late 90s. She now blames the second course for wiping out years of her memory and making her forget even basic words and phrases. Immediately afterwards, very bad headaches. Um, but then you think, well, I've just had this treatment, that's perhaps to be expected. But immediately I knew something wasn't right. I knew I had this instinct that something was wrong with my mother. Um, but I couldn't remember that she had died. And then I had to say to my husband, Chris, you know, what is, what's happened to my mother? And he had to tell me that in fact she had died nearly two years earlier. And that was quite devastating because it's like going through bereavement all over again. Getting the words wrong is a nuisance, it's annoying, it's, it's pretty Yeah, I've lost the word. It's, it's frustrating, but to have lost really basic, important things in your life is, is just awful. Um, that's me somewhere. But, um, Critics of ECT the... say around a third of patients notice some sort of permanent change like this, from memory loss to problems with speech or basic skills like counting money. The author of a scathing research paper into the treatment says it's outdated, dangerous and only effective in the very short term. What happens is that it's a little bit like a charging up a run-down car battery, to be crude. It's not difficult to, to get artificial changes in the brain. You could do it with cocaine. It's not difficult. That doesn't last, of course. 
and then you find a th three, four weeks later the person is either back at the same level of depression or many studies show even worse levels of depression. And then, of course, some of those people think, I felt really good right after the ECT, give me another one. And then they get into this endless cycle, and, and it is perhaps a, a form of addiction. It's not in any way addressing the cause of their depression. It's systematically and gradually wiping out their, their memory and their cognitive function at the same time. Nowadays, you can go to your GP and get diagnosed with bipolar disorder if you've got a certain sort of GP um, for so the sort of symptoms that a few years ago would have been diagnosed as being depression and probably 10 years before that diagnosed as anxiety. And that has partly come about because of a very concerted campaign by the drug companies to expand the... Um, the, the diagnosis of bipolar and the prescription of the drugs that are associated with it. Even though there's no evidence that antipsychotics or mood stabilizers or any other drug smooths out moods or does anything useful for um, variations in emotion, most people are being told these days, or for a long time have been told about antidepressants, is that you should take them because they will help normalize your serotonin levels. That is just not true. There's just no evidence to support that at all. What we should be telling people, we as doctors, GPs and psychiatrists, when we give people an antidepressant, is this. The drug affects the way that people think and feel, not just people with depression, but everyone. But actually, we don't really know how, because we haven't bothered to study it. It might dampen down your emotions, make you feel a bit groggy and drugged. It will almost certainly reduce your sex drive. Would you like to take it? <laughs> Let's say you're taking, and I hope you're not, Abilify or Seroquel or Respital or Zyprexa, one of the so-called antipsychotic drugs. Well, there's nothing antipsychotic about them. We don't know how to pluck psychosis out of the brain. These drugs block a specific neuronal pathway. They block dopamine, which is the main pathway to guess where? Your frontal lobe. So you're getting a chemical lobotomy when you take these drugs. And that produces probably most impactfully apathy, indifference, not caring, not being involved with yourself. So patients who are hearing hallucinations, they don't go away when they take one of these drugs. They just don't care so much about them. But that same poor soul isn't caring as much about his wife or his children or her husband or even rooting for the ball team or religion or the outdoors or anything. It's a generalized apathy and indifference. The same thing produced by surgical lobotomy which cuts the same pathways. I don't have, I haven't developed a faith in medication. I haven't been, you know, swayed. You know, I, I don't feel it's been uh, proven to me that uh, these medications work very well at all. Um, an example would be uh, a young, you know, a young young adult, uh, an actor, and uh, the the psychiatrist uh, uh, didn't know what was wrong with him, and uh, you know, I didn't, you know, I wasn't working particularly with him. I didn't know the reasons for admission, but I don't think they were particularly severe. And they didn't know what was wrong with him, but he knew something was wrong with him. And he was uh, given you know, doses of medication without a diagnosis. And he had a very bad reaction to it. And uh, you know, any, anyone can read the medication and see that 
you know, uh, antipsychotics, antipsychotics or whatever it was put on has side effects of, uh, of mental health problems. And, um, and this person had a reaction and he, was, and he flew off. He became aggressive, he, he uh, wanted to escape, he couldn't sit still, he, you know, it's, um, dr you know saliva. And, um, and the psychiatrist, when I sat in the ward round, said that we'd uncovered, uh, you know, a hidden psychosis. And that and uh, and that's ridiculous. I think he, I, I I couldn't believe you know well, who am I? But he, he, you know I haven't got the training, but I couldn't respect that diagnosis. Um, and he he was in and out for you know until I left, work, you know stopped working. Then. But you feel that that reaction was brought on by the medication, yeah. not by some underlying hidden psychosis. Yeah, there's an underlying hidden psychosis. I mean, I'm sure you know. I don't know. He may, may have may have levels of aggression that he sits on. I don't know. I mean, like, uh, who hasn't got problems? But um, the fact that he reacted in such a strong way after being medicated, to me, is not evidence of a hidden psychosis. I, what, uh, you know, uh, should really highlight and should really bring into question what effect the medication is having. I mean, that should be the primary question. That's what's been introduced to him. You know. There is another subject that needs to be included when we're talking about the dark side of psychiatry is to do with the drugging of children. The information that I have been finding out about is also sort of information given by Ben Goldacre in his book uh, Bad Science. That the use of drug in children is treated as a separate marketing authorization from its use in adults. This makes sense in many cases because children can respond to drugs in very different ways and so research needs to be done in children separately. But getting a license for a specific use is an arduous business requiring lots of paperwork and some specific studies. Often this will be so expensive that companies will not bother to get a license specifically to market a drug for use in children. So it is not unusual for a drug to be licensed for use in adults but then prescribed for children. When GlaxoSmithKline applied for marketing authorization in children for the drug paroxetine, which is also called Paxil or Siroxat. Um, an extraordinary situation came to light, which then triggered a long investigation in the history of UK drugs regulation. This, the reason for this was because between 1994 and 2002 GlaxoSmithKline conducted nine trials of paroxetine in children. The first two failed to show any benefit but the company made no attempt to inform anyone of this by changing the drug label that is sent to all doctors and patients. In fact, after these trials were completed, an internal company management document stated it would be commercially unacceptable to include a statement that efficacy had not been demonstrated, as this would undermine the profile of paroxetine. In the year after the, this secret internal memo, 32,000 prescriptions were issued to children for paroxetine in the UK alone. 
So while the company knew that the drug didn't work in children, it was in no hurry to tell doctors that, despite knowing that large numbers of children were taking it. More trials were conducted over the coming years, nine in total, and none showed that the drug was effective at treating depression in children. Now, um, paroxetine, because it was then realised that it actually increases feelings of suicidal ideation and suicidal behaviour in children and adolescents, it is now not being used or shouldn't be being used for those under the age of 25. Testing has found one it's not effective but also then it can actually increase symptoms of depression and suicide. And also it is known to be one of the most difficult drugs of the antidepressants, the SSRIs to withdraw from because the withdrawal effects are more extreme. Evidence has shown that paroxetine has among the highest incident rates and severity of withdrawal syndrome of any medication of its class. But in 2007 paroxetine was ranked 94th on the list of best-selling drugs with over one billion dollars in sales. In 2006, paroxetine was the fifth most prescribed antidepressant in the United States retail market, with more than 19.7 million prescriptions. In 2007, sales had dropped slightly to 18.1 million but paroxetine remained the fifth most prescribed antidepressant in the US. The children that were given paroxetine weren't simply being given a drug that the company knew didn't work as a treatment for depression. The drug was actually ineffective, but also children taking that drug were being exposed to side effects. Nobody supposedly knew how bad these side effects were because the company didn't tell doctors or patients or even the regulator about the worrying safety data from its trials. This was because of a loophole. You have to tell the regulator only about side effects reported in studies looking at the specific uses for which the drug has a marketing authorization. Because the use of paroxetine in children was off-label, GlaxoSmithKline had no legal obligation to tell anyone about what it had found. GlaxoSmithKline were investigated about this. Um, but when the investigation was published in 2008, it concluded that what the company had done, withholding important data about safety and effectiveness that doctors and patients clearly needed to see, was plainly unethical and put children around the world at risk. But the laws were so weak that GlaxoSmithKline could not be charged with any crime. According to manufacturers of ADHD stimulants, they are associated with sudden death in children who have heart problems. They can bring on a bipolar condition in a child who exhibited no sign of the disorder before taking stimulants. They are associated with new or worse aggressive behaviour or hostility. 
they can cause new psychotic symptoms such as hearing voices and believing that are things that aren't true or new manic symptoms. They can also lead to sleep problems and those taking these medications can end up feeling more subdued and sort of their emotions dampened. One study reported children taking medications for ADHD expressed fears of being harmed by other children and thoughts of suicide. A one study that was done about 20 years ago felt that the amount of misdiagnosis was between about 20 to 25 percent. In 1997, three percent of American school children had received the diagnosis. In 2013, this had risen to 11%, about 6.4 million, between the ages of 4 and 17, about 15.1% of boys and 6.7% of girls. By high school, the figure rises to about 20% of boys. In 2008, $5.5 billion were made in sales of ADHD drugs. By 2016, it is thought that it, it will be between 12 and $14 billion. DSM-5 that came out last year has raised the age at which a child can be diagnosed from 7 to 12 years old. In the previous version, DSM-4, symptoms had to be present by age 7. Now diagnosis can be made up to the age of 12. There is an estimate that 20 million more children are now eligible to be they to be told they have ADHD. 69% of those who are responsible for DSM-5 admit to a tie to the pharmaceutical industry. So it has been thought that the time has now come to seriously reconsider whether the heavily pharmaceutically funded American Psychiatric Association should continue to be entrusted with the revision of the DSM. But it is also known that the drug companies also pay out a lot of money to do with the marketing of these drugs. And psychiatrists also will be given financial incentives for either prescribing the drug or either just giving their opinion that the drugs would be effective. So psychiatrists in certain respects are being paid off or certainly given an incentive of one sort or another to actually prescribe these drugs. One other thing that Ben Goldacre tells us is that the data that is published by these drug companies is actually withheld from everyone in medicine from top to bottom. NICE, for example, the National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence, which was created by the British government to conduct careful, unbiased summaries of all the evidence on new treatments is also unable either to identify or to access data on a drug's effectiveness that has been withheld by researchers or companies. NICE has no more legal rights to that data than anybody else. 
even though it is making decisions about effectiveness and cost effectiveness on behalf of the NHS for millions of people. It is entirely normal for researchers and academics conducting industry funded trials to sign contracts subjecting them to gagging clauses that forbid them to publish, discuss or analyse data from their trials without the permission of the funder. The United States, if you get your diagnosis and it's, in, and it's a DSM, DSM-5 recognised diagnosis, then your insurance company will cover the costs of, that treat, of any treatment. And if your, if your diagnosis is not recognised by DSM-5, you won't. You know, that, there's an example where the classification system is tied very closely to who gets help. And that, that, a lot of worries are, are attached to that. I agree with Simon that it can be incredibly important to have a diagnosis if that uh, will allow you get, to get access to treatment, which you can't get another way. And it is true that NICE, for instance, will only approve certain treatments if you've got a diagnosis and you're in a certain stage. By staying in this hospital, they've taken away my peace of mind. Before this happened to me, I had faith in the psychiatric system. I knew nothing about it really. I didn't really think about it. I, d I just thought what everyone else thought, you know, mentally ill people need to be maybe locked up, drugged. I had no idea. I had no idea what went on. After this, what happened to me, I, I'm just, I was just completely shocked. I was just shocked about how the nurses behaved, how the doctors behaved. Psychiatrists didn't seem to be doing anything. Um, and the more I've read since I've come out, you know, I realise that um, a lot of the things that the psychiatrists um, are told about in their training is actually untrue. That a lot of these trials are untrue and the um, pharmaceutical companies have got a um, really big say in everything. And it's quite scary. It's quite scary. These people can, um, they can do what they like with you. And what they're doing is wrong. And if you say it's wrong, then you're mentally ill and you have no insight. But in actual fact, they're the ones that are wrong. In my situation, there was a lot of... Uh, a lot of communication errors and this, I was the one that suffered in the end. I suffered because of their incompetence. They didn't follow procedures. They weren't very caring. And in the end, it was me that suffered. And um, the complaints procedure was so bad. It's been going on, it's still going on now. And this is like two and a half years later. Anybody that's really mentally ill would not be able to cope with this. It's really stressful having to live through it all the time. When I wake up in the morning, I think about it. What happened to me in that place? I'll never forget it. They've just taken away my peace of mind. And I fear for myself if I ever end up in that place again or even for my children. I think nobody's safe. You're not safe in those places. It could happen to anyone. It could happen to you. Yeah, it, it's not like it used to be terrible and now it's great because of the medication. We're actually forcing people to take very dangerous medication with horrible side effects if they don't take it we tell them it's because they're ill and we, we force them to take it so it, it's not like things have got that much better since the bad old days of the lunatic asylum. They really had found themselves in the inferno.